um, let me just introduce myself. Uh, this is Physio U is, uh, has saved our bacon this year. Um, so many of our motor skills, so many of our uh, different examination techniques and tests and measures, uh, therapeutic exercises, manual therapy techniques. It was so nice to have all of those organized and prepared so that students could reference it as part of their learning experience in this hybrid environment. So it took a lot of burden off of us, uh, off of our faculty. I hope it did for you as well. What led to simulations actually prior to COVID really taking hold, um, I had already begun dreaming about what would it be like if my students, now I can teach them all these basic skills, examination and treatment, uh, exercises, but the hard part actually, the magic happens when we can teach them how to use it, right? So I, we've heard numerous years from our uh, clin ed group, our clin up clin ed team, that the CI say, hey, the students know their special tests, they know their manual therapy techniques, uh, they just don't know when to use it. So all the faculty go back, all the clinical faculty go back and they discuss why is it that the students have such a hard time figuring out how to apply this stuff? Because we didn't, we weren't able to spend enough time helping them create context in which all of these techniques and tests and measures can be applied. I, I mean, I think that's across the board in every, in, commonly in many of the clinical courses. How did we do that for neuro? We brought in neuro patients, didn't happen. How did we do that for peds? We brought in babies for baby day, didn't happen. How did we do it for ortho? We brought in fellows and residents. They would play as patients and we'd have students go through the entire examination, treatment, education, and therax, the whole thing over and over again. Over a span of two days, we would do close to 80 evaluations that the students would watch each other perform. And we do that multiple times a semester. We did it. It was hard. And so I thought to myself, we've got to think of some ways to create a synchronous, simple simulations that allow students to pull these things together, re regardless of whether we have abundance of time. We never have abundance of time. And so we've been building these, rebuilding them, thinking about them, and trying to figure out how to deploy them. So. I just wanted to give you a brief review of SIMS in medicine. Okay, there's just a few slides about that and how it's happening in, in, in rehab education. I wanna show you some, you know, I'm gonna spend less time looking at case studies because I have more simulations for you to look at now. I wanna overview some of the sim simulations and clinical reasoning development cases that we've built um, that will soon be available for you to actually deploy in your class. And um, just to get some of your feedback of things that you've tried, things that you need, um, we have at least a team of five to 10 uh, people building sims, all, all kinds of different sims that I'll show you. Uh, just, just briefly, I've been at Azusa Pacific University for over 17 years now. Um, I'm a teaching and learning fellow at the university. Um, so I've spent a lot of time beyond thinking about the clinical side of what we teach. That's almost the easy part. How do we get them to become clinicians? That's the hard part, right? I think we could all agree. And um, my background is in orthopedics. Um, my manual therapy fellowship was done at Kaiser as well as the orthopedic residency. And um, I teach at this USC Spine Fellowship using many of our apps. Medi the, the Physio U is really um, um, our dream of being an adjunct to improving learning and the teaching experience in physical therapy education. Um, and lastly, I chair the IRB at, at our university. Yeah, one other thing I would just mention is um, our strategic partnership with JOSPT. So there will be a return to sport upper extremity uh, um, consensus statement, consensus article coming out. All of those techniques and exercises are all going to be videos. So I hope you can see the future of what reading journals will be like. Uh, techniques, tests, manual therapy, um, exercises, 
they don't need to be black and white photos anymore. Physio U is going to be a part of that. And so we're looking forward to more and more articles um, coming out of JSPT with videos to help implement the research right into practice. So for those of you who don't know what PhysioU is, we are a ever growing collection of apps completely focused on PT education, okay, for the physical therapy educator. So all of the common classes that we thought, man, it's horrible to read and look at pictures about these techniques, about these transfers, about this gait pattern. We filmed it all. We organized it all. And now we are creating simulations to take it the next step further. So you, you can see we've been doing this well before the pandemic hit because we knew that in a profession such as ours, motor skill, clinical reasoning, developing thought pathways, all of these things can be done with digital, digital technology. And so you can see we've really been ramping up on the different types of things we were releasing, different apps. And all of you as faculty have full access to these apps. Uh, if you don't ha already have access, please feel free to reach out to me. All right, so into the Sims. So um, actually, I just wanna take a moment and open it up to the group before I move forward. Um, how have any of you this year, um, just briefly, utilized simulations in your classroom? So I'm just gonna stop for a second. I just want to get a sense of what you guys have been doing and what you have been building. Um, I'm just gonna stop share for a second. Anybody wanna uh, unmute themselves and just share for a second? Yeah, hi, Dr. Wong. Hi, this is Sam Coppoletti, your old friend. Yeah, good to see you. Now, get my video on. Yeah, I use myself as a simulation when I have no other choices. <laughs> I yeah. had a 50% medial meniscectomy this past December, so I detailed that all with pictures and blow by blow, day by day. And, uh, and I just went through that with them and showed them the anatomy. So I found that that was right. pretty effective because I could be, I, I could answer questions about my own knee, of course, and I didn't have to rely on anything else. So I have used that, but other simulations, um, just case studies from different books, you know, trying yeah. to make them come alive, but it's difficult to videotapes of different yeah. people going through things. Nice. Thanks, Sam. Fantastic. Anybody else? Things that you've tried this year? Hi, Josh. Hi, um, so we've done a couple of um, like Zoom sims where we have standardized patients, nice. um, like a history and systems kind of review. Um, Sim's given a, a patient information to the standardized patient um, and then the students will kind of take a history and kind of try to assess it um, uh, from there. And then also um, we did um, uh, all of our devices for cardiopulmonary stuff with education over like a telehealth kind of experience. And that went really well That's with cool. like flutter valves and incentives barometers and, and all of the other associated devices. Um, and so I thought that that was a good experience for our students to IMTs and inspiratory muscle trainer. Um, awesome. so, you mean uh, you demonstrated it and showed it via Zoom? Uh, the uh, standardized patient would have, we were oh. give, they were given a case and like, uh, uh, history, history and patient information for the past medical history and so on and so forth. And the standardized patient would have the device in front of them. And then the student would need to educate them on how to use the device appropriately, provide um, the appropriate um, educational purposes and also prescription for exercise related to all of those devices, given the case scenario. So we had like uh, patients that had COPD, patients that had um, basically uh, an open heart surgery or a thoracotomy of any kind or other kinds of issues. Um, um, and then they would demonstrate and tell the patient, the standardized patient, how to use it. And then um, the standardized patient would say, so I put this device here. And so the student would have like about basically five minutes to introduce themselves and provide the education and, um, and, and those kind of things. And then five minutes of review with us and the standardized patient on how we did. And so it really made them use their words and education wow. and describing things. It worked very well, so. That's amazing. 
and, yeah. and really the whole class was kind of watching as chosen no no uh, each one was set up or we have a sim lab here that uh, set it up for us I, I work at texas tech um, university health sciences center and um, we have a sim lab that's in amarillo that set it all up and so we had faculty in the room that we would just turn off our screen and turn off our microphone and the student would introduce themselves to the patient ask a few couple clarifying questions and then um, they would be told what device that the patient was sent home with you know from the hospital and then need to provide a telehealth treatment regarding um, any of those devices to the patient and so, so every, every student was able to do that once Yep. Uh huh. Yeah, uh, with the different devices, and so it took a lot of work on our part. But yeah. we had like basically five uh, faculty or six faculty members that set it up, and every fifteen minutes we'd get a new student that would come with that same standardized patient, and that standardized patient would repeat that over like basically ten to fifteen patient or students, basically. And so it worked really, really well. So yeah, that is fantastic. And I the other thing I really like about it is. It was so targeted. Like, this is what we want the students to do. Teach about how to use this device, educate them appropriately, and then you closed it off. Because one of those issues with Sims, big Sims, is they take forever. And there's so many learning objectives scattered through this winding journey that sometimes students can't even get through it. Or, um, or the experience is so drawn out that you diluted the learning for that key thing, those few key things that you really wanted. So I think that's really fantastic. Nice work. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. really, really great. Anybody else? Daniel put something in the chat, Mike, that yeah. uh, you may want to look at real quick. They've been using it in previous years too. Oh, there, yep, Daniel with the Sim Labs, um, high fidel fidelity mannequins. Yep, so I think that's the cool thing about acute care is we can kind of piggyback off of nursing, off of medicine, and utilize a lot of their cool devices. So that's fantastic. So um, acute care labs, simulated patients, that's great. Um, and Daniel, I'm assuming that this, were the students able to come in for those or were those, were those done via Zoom or how was that done? So we, can you all hear me? Yep. So we were able to, uh, it was early 2020, uh, from March until about July were mostly our telehealth simulations that we did. And then similar to what Joshua was talking about a little bit with uh, task specific acute care training. And then from July on, we've actually been back in person with um, PPE use and limited lab space and numbers in lab. But we've been back for most of our simulations since July of 2020. Fantastic. We actually, we ran a, um, <laughs> as you were talking about big sims, if you, if you write them with clear objectives, you can make them work. We actually just got done in May. We do a, a final two-day acute care sim where the students are going in and managing a full caseload over a period of four hours. Um, with wow. a review, with debrief, they manage four to five standardized patients, and then they do a full debrief after that day. Um, and again, if, if you write the clear objectives and you inform the students clearly enough on where they should be, where their learning should be directed, it can happen. And, and we actually had that. So we had two days, one day where they had evaluations and the next day they actually progressed treatment for most of the patients that they saw. Um, that is amazing. A lot of time. <laughs> I mean, I tremble in my I boots just that. thinking about getting all the people set in the schedules. I mean, kudos, kudos to you and the team at Mercer. I mean, it's just, wow. The, the awesome part is having a, a great group of dedicated faculty that are all in for it. So if you can get that, then it works out really well. You know, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, 17 or 18 years later, when comps comes around, you've just finished your two semester stint of ortho and you're toast. And they're like, well, we got to reassess. Are they ready for the clinic? And uh, I'm, uh, man, what can I say? I'm dry, dry as a well in the desert, you know? And, and so I, I love the energy and idea. Um, you know, Sue mentioned how the faculty played patients for OSCEs and practicals. Eventually, 
all my faculty like, I do not want them pushing on me anymore. Like for ortho, right? All these joint mobs. So we again, we've had to think outside the box, but much like you, um, man, it is so invaluable to have the students do to become, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not just gonna give you a hammer and a saw and tell you that one day you'll be able to build a house. Actually throughout the semester with me, I'm going to build houses with you over and over again. So I think, I think we're all in that same alignment that simulated experiences are how you create clinicians. There's no doubt about it. Now the question then becomes, how often can we create these, these massive simulation experiences? I think they're critical, we have to do them. And I also think that there's a, a place for these digital versions, these asynchronous like fire away, all students get to play it out and they'll learn something, right? Even though it's not as involved as what you, you've done, um, uh, Dan, um, Daniel. So let me move forward and then we can continue to get more thoughts from different people. There are lots of different ideas, I think, that were floating around in my mind and in the team's mind as we were beginning to build these things. So um, just to clarify that the idea of the simulation, big or small, whether they're big or small, I really think of them as uh, they can be described as techniques for practice and learning that replaces and amplifies real experiences with guided ones. And they're often immersive in nature. They can evoke and replicate substantial aspects of the real world in an interactive fashion. So as we've been building these things, we've done uh, small ones, we've done complicated ones, we have filmed full evaluations, and now you have to figure out how in the world are you gonna deploy them? Now, I remember someone saying, uh, whether it was a webinar I'd recently watched or one of you had mentioned, um, you can play a video. I think Sam, you talked about, uh, I can show videos of myself. Uh, I can lead discussion. I think that's another great way. Um, that takes a little bit less prep. There's a lot of interaction between the faculty and the student. I think there's a lot of strong relationship built trust and confidence built into the faculty through those relations through those experiences one of the things i tried to put into a little graph what were the things going through my mind when we when i was thinking about why i felt so desperate for these simulations so decreased availability of clinical education sites here in california we've got so many schools in like 30 square 50 square miles that we were already heavily impacted to get clinical sites. Now we're gonna be backed up for at least a year, if not more. Decreased classroom time, another big issue. Increasing experiential learning. Development of entry-level practice competencies. And I'll show you how we've just run a preclinical competency using some of these SIMs as a way to kind of get, to, to get a sense, is this better? Can this augment our OSCE slash multiple choice questions? I'll show you pieces of it uh, in, in a second. And then the need for low stakes asynchronous tools for clinical reasoning development. So this part I think is really valuable. Low stakes asynchronous because one, learning doesn't always happen when it's either you're gonna pass this or fail this. Learning can happen even as they make mistakes. So that's one big thing that I wanted these tools to be, to be. And two, I never have enough time in my classroom. So they have to be asynchronous. They have to be able to be deployed easily. So, and the last thing um, that I would say here is for a class like ortho, which is, which, which is what I just finished, I've got 32 weeks of you know, eight different body regions Therex, special test, examination, movement science, all of these things need to be unpacked on a, almost a weekly basis or else they get, it's an avalanche. They can't dig themselves out from underneath the weight of all of that content. So I really, when you think about the orthopedic simulations that we're gonna be releasing, these are all mini games of the common conditions for the mo for the body for the, all the different body regions, I need for them to play when it comes to shoulder week, a frozen shoulder patient, a shoulder instability patient, 
and a shoulder impingement patient or, or muscle power deficit type patient. So um, I have built, and we are now fine tuning mini games, mini sims for each of those body regions so they can apply examination, apl apply movement analysis, apply intervention strategies, uh, therapeutic exercises, they can apply all of that in mini games that I don't even have to facilitate. They're just going to click on a link and play on their own. So I'll show you a glimpse of that in a second. Some benefits of simulations, what you'll see is that there's enhanced student learning outcomes. It allows students to integrate knowledge and clinical re reasoning ability by making real-time decisions. Who's been doing it? Well, actually nursing, pharmacy, and medicine has been doing it for over a decade. And so uh, granted, some of the things that we do span over long periods of time. Rehab takes time too. So, it's, um, so in some ways it can be a little bit more challenging because what we do changes as a patient goes through the different phases of recovery. How are we going to, how are we going to simulate that? Here in this meta-analysis, simulated patients in physical therapy education, they talked about really saying simulated patients have an effect comparable to that of alternative educational strategies. So that's good. So simulated patients, I think all of us knew, are, gonna, are, are important adjuncts into our classroom. The problem is money and time and COVID, I think, uh, a, big, a big part of it this year. Here uh, in this Physiotherapy Canada article, they talked about how simulators provide feedback to help students learn specific skills. Con computer simulations can augment the learning experience. Much like what you, Josh, uh, Joshua and Daniel have done, human acute care sims positively impact confidence and reduce anxiety, right? Many of our students have not been in the hospital at all. And uh, they found that simulated learning environments can replace a portion or, or a full-time four-week clinical uh, without impairing learning. This is kind of big because OTs have started to do this. So um, using simulations to help replace some of the clin ed time that we're having such a hard time getting for our students. Um, here from the Journal of Physical Therapy Education, they were looking at simulation in PT education and practice and looking for different opportunities. And these are my two concluding slides before I start taking you into what we've built. One is that simulations open the door for rich learning experiences that have potential to achieve high quality, safe and interprofessional practice that future healthcare demands. And simulations can be highly effective instructional tools but it typically is resource and time consuming, which is why some of the things that you guys are doing in your sim labs, we could never replace. Those I think are absolutely fabulous and need to remain. But what we can do at PhysioU is start building things that you don't have to build that you can trust and deploy to achieve certain learning objectives. Um, here in this article, they were talking about the use of SIMS in occupational therapy. And I had mentioned already that many of the programs were using SIMS in OT in some form, which actually is probably similar to us, but they've already started using SIMS to replace clinical hours. So where does SIMS fit on Bloom's taxonomy? Man, it really depends on how you build your SIM. That's the reality. Some of these can be very, very high on the, on, on the pyramid here, right? Because there's a lot of decision-making, a lot of synthesis and integration. Some of it could be really simple. And I'll show you in some of the games we've built, they're just micro steps. They're things that I want to deploy early in the curriculum, even before they know very much, that I think helps them, that will help them further down the line. Some of our range of motion MMT games are like that. Some common reported challenges, time, cost, scheduling. I mean, those are not, those are a big deal and virus, right? COVID-19 virus, that made it hard for us this year. So I'm gonna take you in to kind of glance at some of the things that we've been looking at to get some of your feedback. 
so that you'll know what's coming that you can deploy. It's, it's how we're gonna deploy it or some of, some of which we've already deployed. I think of SIMs as there's big ones and little ones, micro SIMs and macro SIMs. Why? Because the first set we built were all macro SIMs. They were big, they were long and quite involved. They were quite taxing to build and taxing to deploy and tough for the students. So you remember, if you think about, I'm not watching over my students. These, these are asynchronous. There's a very fine balance between challenge and victory that will get a student to play through the entire game. Not every question in a sim has to be gut-wrenchingly difficult. Many of the questions or many multiple choice or interactions in these little mini games, they should be pleasurable. They should help a student say, oh yes, I knew that. Because victory will spur them and carry them through the tough questions. So I'm gonna show you a few of these different mini games that we've created. Uh, first, this one's been out for a year, but many of you might not have started to use it, is these pediatric gait virtual clinic. Helping the students in peds use their gait analysis tools and to do a, a Edinburgh uh, visual gait analysis, right? And later I will show you some of the macro simulations that we've been building. Uh, the, I'll show you the raw material. They're, very, they're quite involved, but they're gonna save us a lot of headaches uh, very soon. When we're, we're done filming them, they just need to be built and they take a lot of energy, time and expertise to build. So um, actually, just for a moment here, does anybody have any thoughts and any questions uh, before I kind of bring you in and start looking at some of these little things we built? Mike, I just put a question on the chat rhetorically for everybody and not so much rhetorically, but actually get an answer. And that is, you made the comment about OT has replaced some of their clinical training hours because of the simulation depth and breadth that they do. Yeah. Is that something that uh, CAPT would ever do or any other folks in, you know, knee deep in education right now doing SIMS? Uh, do you think there's other way that can supplant some of the clinical hours, no, noting that there are now less and less clinical slots and stuff? Yeah, it's a significant challenge. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts about that. Yeah, We actually um, did it out of necessity with an integrated clinical experience um, and were able to record student self-efficacy and confidence and actually no difference between the two groups. Um, obviously for a small scale experience, so it was really just 20% of an integrated experience. Um, but actually I've been, been writing that up and, and citing most of the literature you just gave. Yeah, fantastic. That's great. Yeah, while I, was, while I was still involved in education, Michael, on a full-time basis, I, you know, I, I know that, especially in Jill, I echo your comment that in the PTA program at, at Loma Linda, where I was teaching, um, we were maxed out, and we had actually cut classes out or something. Our, not only just classroom, but also clinical hours, too. So, you know, um, and, and one of the strategies was we'll move that stuff to prerequisite, you know, before you get into the program, you know, maybe your neuroanatomy and stuff, and I'm going, uh I don't know if that's good, but I was wondering if anyone, if there's been a lot of interest on the education section or the um, captain ELC, you know, may have, you know, had that discussion that I wasn't at lately. ACAP yeah. has the Simulation and PT Education Consortium, and they're looking at, at least at the, the content of it. I think they're aware of it. So. Yeah, good. and I admit that I haven't read the most recent APTA um, publication, is, I think is dedicated to... Uh, uh, education and especially during the COVID environment now. And I, I haven't had time to read the, the, the issue yet though. Yeah. Good. Well, let me take you into some of the things that we've recently released or are going to be releasing this summer. This was a collaboration between Physio U and University of Idaho. Um, um, this is um, a virtual learning experience where different children with different, um, different conditions were filmed, turned into avatars to protect their anonymity. And it creates a stepping stone, right? We know gait analysis is challenging because the patient's moving, moving away from you, moving so fast. Here, the student gets to apply a goniometer, a posture grid, and go through a Edinburgh visual gait score 
and basically score what they see and compare themselves to a key. So we've been using this for the last two years in our program as a way to kind of help students develop an idea about movement patterns consistent with these different children with conditions. So you can rotate yourself around, you can raise the eye height, lower it, you can pause the video, you can have them walk backwards or forwards, you can slow it down. And from, from our pediatric faculty, she said, man, this, is, this has been great. It helps me, it gives the students something interactive to do while we're on Zoom and all of them can do it on their own, right? So we don't have to do it all together. They each log in to PhysioU and play with that. So just so I can show you real quick where that's at, if you sign in, you'll see that we have just released the newest version of PhysioU. So you can say, well, here's PEDS. I want to see the PEDS apps. Here's developmental milestones. Here's pediatric gait VR. And here is your virtual gait analysis ready for your students to play. So you have a, a few of these different. So this is me. I'm going to se select a different patient. And you can look at the history of the patient here and then start the gait analysis and then rotate around, look at him from the front or the rear. Okay, so something simple here. Um, stop him. Let's go ahead and pause, slow down the gate speed, go, make him go forward or back a little bit. And then I can pause him, apply a posture grid or apply a goniometer. Okay, so this is a somewhat virtual virtual reality type environment, but we apply it into a clinical setting. And then you can have discussion about what, what everybody found with case one, right, with Sarah. And you can also compare your answers, the student's answers to the key. So the key is built in here. So that's one of the uh, things already available that we've been using and the faculty have really liked using that. All right, let me move on to these simulation ideas. So here's one of the macro ones, one of the big ones. So this was to help replace some of our patient days. So far, we have filmed four evaluations and treatments, a patient with an incomplete spinal cord injury, Asia D, a patient with Parkinson's, a patient with traumatic brain injury, and then a patient with some type of cerebellar degeneration. Now we had to decide what are we going to do with this amazing collection of videos? How are we going to make it a useful learning experience for the students? So I'm gonna take you there to take a look at what this looks like. So here is John. And essentially what's going to happen is there's a little preamble that says, hey, this is what you're going to be doing today. And this is what you're going to learn. So there's going to be some documentation, assessing and analyzing objective tests, viewing the subjective exam and reflecting on components of it. Then we decided to build out of this macro game, a bunch of mini games because the macro game would be so long that I don't think a student could get through the whole thing in one sitting. So my vision for this and Mary, Mary Hudson McKinney who has been working on this with us um, she's the, the, the instructor here that you'll see doing the evaluation and treatment. We basically broke out all the common things that we were going to do in the examination and treatment. And then we built questions, reflection questions, multiple choice questions that you could collect and review if you wanted to. Granted, a lot of the learning was going to happen because every time you submit an answer, a little clinical reasoning pearl would come up so that the student could see into the mind of, of, this, uh, of the faculty. So let's just take a quick look here. All right, so welcome. It was a pleasure having you come into the clinic. My name is Mary. Hi, Mary, nice to meet you. And I'm gonna be your physical therapist. Okay. So, so John, can you give me a little bit of background information? I talked briefly to your doctor, but I'd like to hear from your own words. Um, uh, what happened on that uh, fateful night, morning, your morning? Yes. I actually uh, 
I got up uh, on a Saturday morning. It was about three fifteen. I was first. I was startled. I thought I was late to work. Uh, and you're up early for work, I, right? Usually, I get up a little earlier than that for work. And uh, I got up uh, a little disorientated, not not too bad. Then I went over and checked on my boys in the room where I have a two story house. So I was upstairs. Uh, proceeded was going to go downstairs. I just misstepped on the step and uh, went into like a like into a slide into second base into a dive. <sighs> Oh my uh, went down, uh, remember hitting my head one good time and basically at the bottom of the stairs, I cannot move anything from that point. So, so if you think about, so we broke the subjective exam into many pieces because we thought that there were little things that we should ask the students to be, to connect with, to reflect about. So there is a fine balance between these open-ended questions what do you suspect could be the patient's diagnosis based off the patient's symptoms at the time of injury? So you can enter that. And then boom, here's some thoughts. All right, so sometimes simulations are hard. I'm thinking of these as formative, right? So I'm, I'm less interested that they know everything and can score all the right things. I just want them to go through the process. What does a neuro eval look like? What kind of testing would I do for a patient that looked like this? What kind of intervention should I do? I want them to see all of those pieces. We're, we are using these and in the beginning of the course to create a big picture experience for the students. So you can move on. There's different parts of the subjective exam. And eventually, let's see, let's watch the patient walk on a compliant surface. John, go ahead and let's walk on the grass. Okay, so one of his goals was I want to go and watch my kids play soccer. I'm the, I'm the coach for the high school football team. I want to do that, but I'm having a hard time getting on these soft surfaces. So here's your questions. What difference did you notice when the patient used the lost strand crutches to ambulate? How does this information directly direct your treatment? The student types in their thoughts and then Mary sends her thoughts. Okay, so think about what this means for the formative side of a student walking in the beginning of neuro, having been able to play out one, two, three, or four of these over a semester. They can do it in little pieces, experience the entire evaluation. Okay, eventually John said, hey, I have, I have a hard time talking while I'm walking. All right, so this next phase, we're gonna do the exact same thing. Okay. But um, while you're walking, you're gonna be saying the alphabet, skipping every other letter. So you're gonna say A, C, E, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Uh, while I'm walking? While you're walking, okay? Okay. All right, so. You got me nervous already. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you feel ready or you want to rest a little bit? No, I'm ready. Okay, ready, set, go. A, C, E, G, I, K. Okay, and so after you watched the patient perform the dual task tug, what were some things you noticed about his movement? And there's Mary's thoughts. Patient's velocity slows as he needs to think about things. Neither of the tasks are performed fluidly. What might you want to add or change to this assessment to make it easier for the patient? Yada, yada, and boom, here's the thoughts. So if you think through... We watch his functional movements. You can look at his stairs, his stair assessment, dynamic sitting balance. There's questions related to each of these, five times sit to stand. Um, and it goes all the way from examination to objective testing to interventions and, um, and patient education. I just want to stop for a moment and get your thoughts. 
this is macro, it's big. Any thoughts from the group about this? Our goal is to create three to four of these macro ones that cover the common neuro conditions, somewhat common neuro conditions. So students can see all the way from beginning to end and interact with it asynchronously and hear and look into the mind of a clinical specialist into a neuro faculty's mind and be able to see how all of this comes together. Think about the context that that brings to all the little pieces that you're gonna to deliver to them. I was gonna say these are gonna be the, um... These types of scenarios are ones that are challenging for standardized patients to recreate. And it um, almost makes it impossible to do some of these types of scenarios or even sometimes the orthopedic, they don't know exactly how to play out um, even what's written. You give them all the details. So um, I, I like the diversity of the cases with bringing in um, kids and some of these neurological impairments and some of those patients in the community or people in the community are hard to bring in um, right. or getting them at the stage where you're going to be seeing them in the clinic. So kind of creating that in this type of environment. Um, again, I think the emphasis on the low stakes environment, um, I think is really helpful so that when they get out in the clinic, they're not as fearful or hesitant in working with these types of patients. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Andrea. Andrea. Yeah. There are a couple um, things in the chat you may want to look at, yeah, Michael. One is uh, the Yo, PTA. About PTA. So this is on our list of things to film as well. Um, it's We're testing first because we're learning a lot from filming this content. And then we are actually beginning to storyboard. We have some faculty involved in helping us with storyboarding scenarios that are relevant for PTA, the PTA. Um, so that is going to be I mean, all of this, you can imagine, takes enormous amounts of time from filming to editing to creating the, creating the um, content. But I guess what you could see is, um, and Jill, I'd love to talk with you more about that. We always need more help related to this. Um, but I want you to see the, the concept of it. What does a macro learning simulation look like? And how there's a balance between multiple choice and open-ended questions? Um, there's no major points to this. We just want the student to experience what does this patient look like and how does a therapist do their job well? Okay, I wanna keep going, James, because I always run out of time. Let me show you some of the shorter games, okay? So here we have, uh, we have a bunch of mini games, okay? So um, these are all available for you as faculty to play through, actually. I'm just going to give you a quick glimpse. So there's some physical agents mini games, some range of motion MMT mini games, some ortho sims, and some neuro mini games. So let me give you a glimpse. Where we were testing this out, we just did this about three weeks ago, actually two weeks ago. We had our students go through and use these mini games as simulation slash competencies. So in a summative format. So here's the ultrasound mini game. And we were curious whether the students could look at a case. This patient probably has biceps tendonitis of some sort, some type of overuse injury, some impingement. And after the eval, so we skip to what we really want to test. We didn't go into the entire evaluation that would make the game five times longer. We decided that ultrasound was gonna be the modality of choice or the physical agent of choice. So question one, before you apply the ultrasound, what is, uh, what, which of the following is a contraindication? Because of course, all of our students had to review and prepare for their comps. What were the contras and precautions for uh, all the common different modalities? Okay, so let's say, um, Something like that. I don't, I'm just going to keep moving. It'll take a second, sorry. Oops, move to the next mini game. Let me move here. Let's say. Uh, 
No, oh, I think this here, let me take you through this way. Oh, there it is. Prior to treating him with ultrasound, you want for him to be placed in a comfortable position. So what position would you like for him to be in? So I'm going to put him seated with his arm by his side or sideline with his arm slightly extended. So I'm going to put him here. Take a second. What intensity would you like to use? So is it acute? Is it, um, is it uh, chronic? And so they would, they, they have memorized some of these different settings and also tried to make some sense out of basically whether it's acute or uh, chronic. Uh, should this be one megahertz or three megahertz? Is it superficial or is it deep? Okay, so let's go ahead and just submit. Actually, we could do three megahertz, it's okay. Just for example here, what setting would you use? Oh, well, the patient is highly irritable. There's some mild swelling. I better use pulse ultrasound. So I'm gonna do 20% pulsed. And then we ask them to now perform the ultrasound. And we give them a situation. So the situation is, the patient's complaining of sharp pain at his acromion. What should you do next? Should you stop ultrasound immediately? Should you hold the transducer statically? Or should you move the ultrasound at a cons consistent rate? So some of these little games are meant to put them in a problem situation and help them problem solve a little bit. Okay, so mini game, it's done in about five minutes and it allows me to assess it puts them in a scenario that allows me to assess their clinical reasoning. So that is one of the different types of mini games. Let me show you a neuro mini game. So, he, oh, actually, let me show you the range of motion mini game. So here's shoulder assessment. Um, here is, here's where I'm thinking, actually, we built a lot of these. We've, we're already done building them. Um, we thought about clinical skills one, which is range of motion MMT. Um, our students, when they got to ortho, kept saying, well, um, I don't remember a lot of range of motion stuff. It was so long ago. And I didn't think to use this range of motion assessment because when I was in range of motion MMT class, I just learned how to do range of motion MMT. It wasn't well connected to any clinical scenario. So we decided to make these into little clinical scenarios. So if you begin this little game, here's Dan saying, hey, I have shoulder pain and I cannot reach the top of my shelf. I can't get cups off the top of the shelf and I can't wash my hair. So the question we ask the student is based on this patient's objective, what motion do you think he has a problem with, right? So I think it must be flexion, okay? They remember at this stage of their curriculum, because we're gonna deploy these in year one, semester one, they don't know a lot about AGs and eases and conditions yet. So we made the game simple enough that it's tied largely to function. So we said, watch your patients perform his aggravating movement. Okay, so we have watched him perform his ag aggravating movement. And then we ask them, now, do you remember how to measure? So drag a gray box from the right to the, to the current location on the goniometer. What are your landmarks? So mid axillary line, let's say lateral epicondyle, and then let's see, coracoid process. Now your patient's laying there on the table. Please place the axis of rotation in the right location. So this was the way we thought would be best, we were best able to mimic that idea of having the students apply the goniometer to the right places. Now measure your patient's range of motion. So we can apply the slider to the right location, right there, submit. And now to the hard part, 
you staring at all of these numbers and you have no idea which was the right number, right? So because this is the summative version, there's no clues. When you get it wrong, it doesn't teach you anything. But in the mini game that the students will play during their course, if you get it wrong, a little slide will come up and say, always watch the video again of the patient's movement and what you were measuring, predict what you might find, and now read the goniometer. So there's these little clues that help the student to learn how to read a goniometer that has numbers everywhere. And then we, again, try to get them to connect with some of the normal values that they've memorized, and the game should be over. Okay, so those are, there's a, think of those as mini games. What was its purpose? One, I wanted them to apply range of motion MMT to the concept of someone's functional activity. Some, they don't even have to know what the condition is. I just want them to see that a patient can't do something. What motion do you think is limited? How can you measure it? Do you remember the landmarks and what the normal values are? Boom, that learning objective is done. We will have a bunch, I think we have at least six or seven upper quarter, six or seven lower quarter, and some spine range of motion games. The way that we're gonna deploy it in our classroom is at the end of that week, there's gonna be a hyperlink, right? Basically a, a hyperlink from here that you're gonna put into your LMS that says at the end of this week, now that you've learned shoulder range of motion, please play this game. Just try it out, apply it functionally. Any thoughts about that game before I move on? We did the same thing for MMTs, mini games for MMTs tied to basic conditions. What like there's a, yeah. there's a lot of comments on the chat and Sam has his hand up and I think he's also, he's already uh, chimed yeah. in on the chat too. So very Before. positive comments, yeah. Sam. See, um, when will these be available to us? Um, probably by fall, uh, late summer. We are, we deployed this right now and we realize there's a lot of work that goes into making sure they all look the same um, but they're all already created and done and i would add in that we added a we filmed a bunch of posture ones too so it's like what posture do you see what muscles do you think are tight what muscles do you think are weak what kind of things would you do to improve the impairments that these postures you know things like that because again posture is one of those things we teach it to them we show it to them, and then they have no idea what to do with it from then on. So all these mini games are part of uh, our class, Clinical Skills 1. They will be available. There will be a button that's coming up here on our apps. So if you go to our apps here. Um, so there will be a new button called Simulations. And Simulations will have all of these mini games, and you will be able to cut URLs and then put them into your syllabus so you can tell your students, I want you to play these MMT games, these range of motion games, and you just put it right into your syllabus or into your LMS. They click on it. They have to log in to their own account, which means they can submit the scores to you if you wanted to use it as quiz scores. So that's the range of motion MMT game. You know, the neuro the neuro mini game, let me just show you the neuro mini game and then I'll close off with giving you a glimpse, um, giving you a glimpse of some of the interprofessional stuff we've been doing. So there's an MMT game as well. The MMT game is kind of like, please place the arm in the appropriate position, move the slider, put them in the right MMT position. And then please put dots where you are stabilizing and where you are applying force. So you can imagine we're, we're using this as a reverse engineering way to help the students tap into the knowledge that they have, but tie it to a patient scenario, like someone walking with Trendelenburg gait, right? What would you like to test? Where should you stabilize? And then the therapist ends up doing the, the MMT and verbalizes what they found. So you get to see that the patient breaks, you get to hear the therapist, uh, what they said, and then the student has to grade it. Let me do this one. This is a timed up and go mini game. Why is this valuable? 
because NeuroClass is full of tons of these different tests. And the students said to us, we don't know when to apply all of this content. So we're created, we've created mini games of a lot of the common tests that the students are gonna do. And we're basically re-leveraging stuff that we've gathered from all the videos that we've been capturing. So here, imagine using this after balance week, right? So this balance week, they've learned all of these tests and they're gonna play a few mini games to kind of apply their knowledge. So 65 year old male Asia D is having difficulty with balance during ambulation. I don't think we have it on our screen, Michael. We have you. Yep. Let me share screen. Thank you. So I'm back here. There you go. What's up? So what would you do to assess his fall risk? Well, I'm going to do a timed up and go. Great. So let's do it. We watched the video. Oh, actually, I want to ask them first. How do you set up the timed up and go? Um, how should the patient begin the test? Seated at with back against the chair. How does the therapist accurately record it? Well, the time is started when the therapist says go or when the patient's back leaves the chair. Okay, so I'm going to do that. And now, Click on the video to play the video and hit the start stop button to start your timer. All right, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna, when I say ready, set, go, you're gonna stand up using the walker. You're gonna come around this yellow piece of, or yellow, the blue piece of tape. You're gonna turn around that tape, come back to the chair and take a seat, okay? All right, so ready, set, go. Oops. So they have to time it right, because the next question, so imagine if the test is done, the next question gives them some options. They just have to have measured it properly. And when they measure it, we ask them to interpret it. Given this time frame, what recommendation would you give the patient? The patient should use assistance when emulating in the community. In the formative, in these mini games, there's a little hint, right? This is what the patient scored. These are the normal values. Now make a decision. So there are a number of these. I will, I will, you know, eventually I'll do it. When we have them all available, I will do another mini webinar to talk you through and walk you through all the mini games that we've created so that you'll be able to understand how to deploy it. Again, we, we decided that the best way to help them integrate some of this content is to put them in the patient scenario, create enough context to allow them to apply an appropriate test, make an interpretation of that test, and then close the game off. Not all sims have to be an hour long. In fact, that's probably not the best way to create sims. The, the hour long sims really make it difficult for a faculty to know what is going on in that sim and also what are the learning points what are the challenge points so that's why you see me see us building a lot of these mini games um, uh, it's it's for that purpose all right the last couple of things i want to show you as i know we're running out of time um, there's some orthopedic mini games the orthopedic mini games are kind of scenario based Okay, so here's a basic mini game. We are building, you, you will see, we're building a bunch for, uh, for PT, we're building some for AT as well. Um, but what I just want to give you a glimpse of what this looks like. So the patient case, there'll be some matching questions, some multiple choice questions, and it's valuable for the student to know how long this is gonna take. No one wants to get into a sim and have no idea how far along I'm going to be going in this game. So this game starts with someone with an ankle sprain. There's a little bit of a story. And you can learn about the outcome measures, the symptoms, the activity limitations, or the medical history. So you can click on these different things and look at the outcome measures. 
look at the signs and symptoms that they're complaining about. And then you can essentially talk about what is the best treatment for this patient based on their acuity. Remember that these games, they're asynchronous for one. They may be the first time they're actually pulling together all the concepts of treatment, of irritability, the subjective and the objective, the therapeutic exercises. Many of these games we built to be relatively simple because my goal was to deploy them as their first opportunity to use the things they learned that week in their, uh, on the weekend, right? So for my ankle problem, for my ankle and foot lab, they will play a plantar fasciitis game, a ankle sprain game. This ankle sprain game will eventually take you through not only was when they were acute, but will bring them back several weeks later where they're subacute. And the management strategy is no longer managing this inflammation and protecting the tissues. It is now restoring the mobility. So many of these games we've built in hopes that we can actually get a student to see the change of impairments over time, the targeting of these appropriate impairments with appropriate interventions. They're meant to be easy. I want lots of fun victory for the students when they play these games out. Okay, so there's uh, some of these games there be available for you to try out um, if you want to. They're on the web. As I mentioned here, if you log in to your new site, it, all faculty can log in. You, you all have um, logins. You will see some of these sims here that you can play through. And we will be updating this one actually, um, probably even before you guys end up playing it. But um, the last few slides, I know I'm running over time. I want to show you what we've been doing for interprofessional education. So um, there's a few faculty members in our group who are tasked with this mammoth task. They bring nursing together, psychology together, PT, social work. It's a massive event. So what we did here is you see a group of, there's PT, OT, nursing, MD, speech, all together doing an evaluation on our traumatic brain injury, our patient with traumatic brain injury. So we brought them into the studio and we filmed every single one doing a full evaluation. That means we have PT, OT, speech, physician, and nursing doing full evaluations. Now, the students don't need to see all of that. They're only going to see abbreviated portions that allow them to understand what does each profession do. They will be able to see treatment sessions. So we brought the patient back in the second day, we did treatment sessions. You get to see PTOT speech do treatment sessions. Okay. So how cool is that? You get to watch an abbreviated OT eval, a speech eval, the physician coming in and, fill, and, and assessing the patient. And then, we had an interprofessional team meeting where each member of the team, imagine in the game, you'll click on the OT, he will give his report. You'll click on the speech therapist, she'll give her report. The physician, physician is driving the entire conversation. And now we're beginning to tie ourselves together, think about things to keep in mind, talk about discharge planning. The case manager was there. This whole experience, they will learn about each profession, they will get to see glimpses of how they do their thing. And then they will get to be a part of an interprofessional team meeting. And there will be interactive questions, multiple choice questions built into this whole experience. Just as a brief side note, I have been thinking a lot about psychological conditions. And so we brought in a PT, as well as a PsyD PT, psychologist slash PT. And we basically filmed a, a, a patient talking about their terrible low back pain and some of their suicidal depressive thoughts. So you get to watch moments of this experience. You get to see the, patient, the therapist doing the evaluation. 
We ask questions about what the students are, are seeing, what they're hearing, and whether there should be referral. And then we have an interprofessional consult between the PT and the psychologist, and the psychologist giving some thoughts about how the PT should manage the patient. We are busy storyboarding this with our psychology faculty, and we are essentially covering the schizo probably the more common, uh, more common psychological um, conditions. So that takes us, I know I ran a little bit over time. I want to show you that these were the things that were coming to PhysioU. This is what your student, you will be able to deploy for your students to experience. Any thoughts and comments or ideas? I know a lot of people had to leave, but are there any other thoughts or comments? I have a question. Hi, Barbara. Hi, how are you? Good. I love your application. Awesome, awesome. Um, I have a question. So uh, I, we per, we're gonna purchase uh, PhysioU for our new students coming in cohort. And remember, we are PT assistants. Yep. Not, I mean, I'm not, but the students are. Right. And what could you advise me to engage them more to start, uh, uh, because they're gonna be uh, newbies to your application. Mm -hmm. And some of the students are, uh, like probably all humans are more into like, oh, let me play with it. Let me see how I can get it. Let me research it. And some of them are not going to touch it unless you made them to. So right. that the, the, the discrepancy between the competency of the students who are very good at it and say, oh, my God, I forgot to how to do range of motion. Please, you you. Right. right. Um, so my, my biggest concern was with my second year students who had this application where when their CIs were asking them, hey, can you do range of motion? They would draw blank. And for me, it was like, please, you, you. Right. Please, you, you go to the bathroom and you pretend you have to pee, but you're yeah. actually looking at the application and you come back and you say, yes, I know. So I need that. I need you to help me to help them. How yeah. do I, what do I do to engage them to like, hey, play with it, not just for the purposes of, uh, of the course, but what do I do to have them more, to be more competent, more use it as like a lifelong um, learning tool. Yeah. yeah. So two things. One is when our students get it the first day of their class on orientation day, mm -hmm. they get an email so it's yes. here at our website under educator faculty resources. Yes. And under setup, mm -hmm. we have an email. So this is, um, let's see, how to navigate PhysioU. So if you look at the PDF here. Yes, yes, yes. You'll see that all of our students get this. Yeah. And it has mm -hmm. all kinds of cool little things. And when mm -hmm. they click on any one of these things, it takes them actually to the app and it will show them cool stuff. Yes. Oh, this is a patient with shoulder impingement. So this is kind of like, welcome to the program. Yes. We are going to be using this throughout, pretty yes. much throughout the program. Play mm -hmm. through these different parts to kind of get a glimpse of what you're going to be learning. So that's mm -hmm. one, one way. The second way is a faculty member has to use it regularly in the classroom for them to begin to get a feel for it. Okay. So whenever I'm in ortho, I pull mm -hmm. out ortho and I'll say okay guys we're talking about shoulder I walk them through it I'll say guys we're talking about shoulder impingement today so here's my shoulder impingement mm -hmm. and we're going to be looking at some of these different tests right some of these special tests that you guys have already previewed in your lab so here is my special test the reason why I walk them through it I take I don't have to do this for all the conditions I just do this for some key conditions by seeing how the instructor navigates it and teaching them. So when I'm with the patient and I'm trying to prove or disprove that this is a shoulder impingement patient, I may use some of these tests that you guys, that we're gonna practice in lab. When they see me navigating this and then inviting them when you're in the clinic, because we can't remember all the special tests all the time, it's okay for you to go into the condition, 
look in the physical exam, find the test that you need, determine if it has the right sensitivity and specificity for what you're trying to achieve. And you can review the technique here. Little things like that on a regular basis help the student to actually really understand. It's almost, it's almost like an Encyclopedia Britannica. It's so big that students almost don't want to touch it because there's too much in there. But every faculty member must take advantage of the resource, use it regularly, because then the students feel like, oh, that's really what's in there. That's how I get to it. So I would say those two big things. One is the intro. And two is each faculty member should try to demonstrate something from the app and then lead them to this connection to the clinical environment. So that's what I would say, Barbara. Great. Well, we already using that definitely the introduction and I've, um, uh, so we definitely have to make sure that uh, they use it uh, very frequently with all the other courses. Yeah. So that was yeah. very helpful. Thank you. I think Barbara, my comments um, with this as, as an educator for a long time, if it's used early in the curriculum, early in your program, they just know that's the norm and they'll go reference it, they'll go back to it. Also, to, if everyone, the faculty or most of them use it, uh, like for example, they do range of motion and manual muscle testing and they can put in like little blurbs, like, you know, you'll use this when you get to your ortho and you do your assessment. And so you can always come back and look at it to remind yourself. And so, and then in ortho, you can go back and say, hey, remember what you were taught by Dan back in manual muscle test and range of motion stuff. So it kind of, you know, it, they kind of dovetail each other and help out with that. And then just got to spend time with it. It's one of those things that can be overwhelming at first, but, you know, small bites, how to eat a whale one bite at a time. Yeah. So, yeah. So. And I noted, Andrew, great to, great to hear from you. Andrew, the mini games for screening for referral, that's, that's the perfect mini game. It doesn't have to be a complete ortho evaluation. It can be a portion of the ortho evaluation where some red flag finding occurs. And in that moment, we ask the student to identify, what did you note about this finding? What is your choice here? Treat, treat and refer, refer out only. So I think there's, um, that is definitely something that I'll put on my list. I know you and Tony are always working on this general med medical screening type thing. Um, it will be made, I promise. Cool. Sounds, sounds good. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Awesome. Other thoughts, comments. Any other types of mini games that you can think of that would be really useful for us to help build? I know we don't have very many people left, but all of your thoughts. So you guys can see that a lot of these things are, are, have been created. We filmed a lot of things. This is our patient with the depressive symptoms. They're going through a full eval. Talk about ags and eases. Could you tell me what makes your back pain worse? Uh, if I lean certain directions, so if I turn wrong, it's spasms. Mm -hmm. And uh, that makes my stomach upset. Mm -hmm. And then I take the acetaminophen and then my stomach gets more upset. So there is some hopelessness, um, many things that she cannot do. What would be the most helpful response to Mrs. Cook at this point? And then here are some little clues from the psychologist, actually, PsyDPT, Psy adding some of their thoughts. So in the end, the patient begins to describe some suic suicidality issues. And so we asked the, we asked the student, what are important factors to address when assessing suicide risk? Now, uh, eventually there is a chat discussion about referral. So we've been through a few sessions and um, I wonder how it has been for you. Discouraging, because uh, mm -hmm. my back still hurts a lot. Mm -hmm. So she's discussing about referral to other healthcare professionals. There is an interprofessional so conversation. I'm for you. What kind of stands out when you're working with patients with depressive symptoms? So psychologist PT is talking with PT. There are some key takeaways. And we are building this for some of the common psychological disorders, probably bipolar, um, maybe schizophrenia. And they're not all going to be interviews. 
Some of them are going to be during FairX, some stuff comes up. During uh, application of modality, some things come up. And so there are different scenarios, clinical scenarios, that again, you can help students begin to identify these elements, um, affective elements, and begin to make some appropriate decisions about how to change the way they communicate or how to change the environment to help the patient. So there's some cool stuff coming related to these, uh, these kind of interprofessional mini simulations that we're doing. Mike, uh, Soren has a question. Soren. Yes, thanks. Um, this may be um, way outside of your scope or your intentions, but um, I teach a lot of our content on cross-cultural communication and mm. cultural awareness. And it strikes me that for some of the larger cultural groups within the US, it might be helpful to have some mini SIMs on the cultural interactions. If you're gonna address you know, the psychological domain and, and things we should be thinking about psychologically with our patients, um, it seems fitting to also be thinking about um, the cultural interactions too and communication across cultural barriers. Soren, would you reach out to me at Mike at PhysioU to chat about this? We are actually about to film. Um, this is in collaboration with some faculty colleagues at UPenn um, PTA program. So it's a PT-PTA collaborative um, uh, about um, uh, emotional intelligence and conflict management. So we're filming scenarios in which you could do things the wrong way and it goes off the rails. Mm -hmm. Or if you apply these conflict management techniques, you can watch how it stays on the rails and actually resolves appropriately. Um, the same idea, I think, would be very powerful this, for, the, for the cultural diversity and communication, intercultural communication. I think that would be so fun to actually film these different common cultural ways of communicating and help mm -hmm. students see and navigate that. So I think that absolutely could be on our list. I mean, we're doing this already related to the cult, to the conflict management and, um, mm -hmm. and um, emotional intelligence. So I think that would be another great tool that we could easily deploy widely. I mean, that's always kind of my thing when we're trying to figure out time, resources, and energy. What are some really impactful things that we can do that you just can't read about, you know? Right. And really watching those experiences and, and how the therapist is trying to connect with a patient are things that you just cannot simulate in, in any other way. Right. And it would even be helpful, you know, in the clinic then, if you know you have a patient coming in who is um, Somali or Vietnamese, you know, and to go through and, and look at um, one of these videos and, and look at, okay, what's, you know, what are some mistakes I might make or what are some things I can do to promote a more, a better therapeutic alliance with this patient, you know, and make them more comfortable in my clinic. You know, just the same yeah. as you would go and look at what's the technique for measuring shoulder flexion, you know, on, and you could look these up quickly and kind of get a little primer on how do I address this patient who's from a different culture. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've done some of that. I, let me just show you real quick here. We've done some of that here. One, so we filmed a bunch of acute care cases. Um, let me see. I don't remember whether it was. And we filmed one completely in Korean. Um, nope, that's not the one. And there was an interpreter. It was challenging. Um, huh? Yep. And, you know, it's those kinds of, I don't think it's this one either. Um, Essentially, it's, we filmed a bunch of these acute care settings because, again, we couldn't get our patients to come in to do our patient days. Um, and these scenarios will be built into a bunch of, um, will be built into a bunch of, what would you say, kind of interactive evaluation slash interactive treatment sessions, you know, mm -hmm. so here, I think. Ready so we can try to walk, okay? So, anyways, I, 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 there's more of that coming, but I really like that idea. I, I'll tell you that when we were filming a lot of these neuro patients, 
um, patient, patients with neurologic um, problems, they, uh, we've been carefully trying to choose different um, races. Mm -hmm. um, we are filming a movement analysis app right now, which is we're going into the homes of patients of, with many of them are neurologic patients, but some of them may have other conditions and we're filming them doing all of their daily tasks, their activities of daily living. Um, and some of it is cultural. Like I like to use chopsticks. Not everybody likes to use that. So we film specific things related to certain culture. Um, I think that's valuable too, when we think about movement analysis, task analysis, things like that. So I, I'm quite aware of it. Um, I think it's a great idea and we would love to chat more with you about it because I think from our perspective, um, if we have this targeted list that you think would be great to film and what may be the great, the scenario to film. And then perhaps what are the key elements that we want students to be able to identify and modifications or adaptations of how they interact with the patient that we would want them to be aware of, those could be built into asynchronous learning experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, in some cases they could just be a library of content that faculty can use, but I like the idea of the asynchronous deployment because it allows students to learn at their own pace and it, it, gives, it actually frees up my time because I'm already impacted in the classroom. I, um... Soren, I, I appreciate your comment you put in the chat uh, about a half hour ago and that, you know, that a lot of these sims and even the app itself, you know, it's great framework. And I just comment that, yeah, and yet it doesn't replace the teachers. I mean, you still got to look at the level of competency a person has and how they ask the question. I tell a new teacher, they said, if you listen very critically how a student asks a question, you'll ask them where their, where their lack of information or lack of understanding is. If you just got to be a very critical listener as a teacher. And, uh, and especially now, I think, um, how about a physical therapist student or physical therapist student who got introduced to PT because I had an ACL or a sprained ankle and they have no idea what a, a Parkinson patient is. And you start talking about it in neuro and, and they have this app now to show them what that looks like. And it's mm -hmm. kind of really neat for those folks. And, and with HIPAA and the restriction now for like pre PT, pre PTA, you know, experiences is, is limited. So I really, so we're never going to be, they're never going to replace us with an app. I mean, I'm pretty safe. I think our jobs are safe, but, uh, I think it's a good augment, a good basic starting point for everybody. If you all looked at the app, it goes back to make them look at it before the thing. And Mike has slides on, you know, pre-watching it and then preparing for the lab and asynchronous and stuff, and then in lab doing stuff together. So I really appreciate your comment about um, it's a good uh, framework developing the students' understanding for the case and the, and the and the pathology. So great observation. Thanks. Yeah, we'll reach, we'll reach out. Would you reach out to me? Um, sure. Dylan? That'd be great. Sure. Any other comments, questions, thoughts, ideas? So Mike, I had a question actually. How, how does it actually, the rolling out the psychosocial depression? Cause I think it's one thing if students are clicking on a thing that says we're gonna assess for depression versus if it just pops up in a case. So I guess I'm wondering how do you implement it? Yeah, so um, it's, it's a great, great thought. Some of these um, depressive and anxiety type um, affective signs and symptoms, um, I think are built into some of our games related to chronic pain because it's so commonly associated. But for some of these particular cases in particular, we have a special topics class where a psychologist comes in to talk about the common psychological disorders and some potential modifications that things that you wanna watch out for, when to refer out and how do you modify your treatment. Um, my goal was to augment that particular course, that class with these mini games because from their didactic lecture, they would have discovered prevalence, signs and symptoms they may have some basic understanding of some things to do, to do different. But then when they actually get to play and watch someone with depression, then actually it, I think it kind of, it kind of makes it more real and it allows them to take one step closer to being able to identify and manage appropriately when they see a patient in the clinic. So my thought was that in this particular course, uh, which is like a special topics course, 
this will be part, this will augment that particular day. And it will be something that we can score. Um, I don't remember whether these particular games actually have a scoring mechanism, but it, at the very least, it can allow the students to put their thoughts down, to take some, some of these questions and make some choices and to learn from the side DPT who is trying to give some extra feedback. Now, at the very beginning of the game, there's a disclosure about the scope of practice. Like that's not your job to, to diagnose this person as depressed, but we want to help you begin to get to, to be aware of the signs and symptoms and be able to do the appropriate thing. Um, what's interesting about the game is actually there's a moment where the therapist is about to respond to the patient who's not doing their home exercise program. And there is a empathic pathway and a kind of more um, confrontative pathway. You get to watch each way and see how this, the patient responds to that. And so if I were to come back to your question, I, I think it could, these don't have to be played out in ortho. They can be played out at pathophys where you're talking about depression and anxiety. It could be played out in one of your special topics course or if it is part of ortho and you want it because you're talking about chronic pain, this would be a very appropriate place for you to place it. That's part of our, our, our thinking for a lot of these mini games are, if I built seven massive games, it would be very hard for faculty to figure out how to deploy it. But if I, if I build very targeted mini games, it gives faculty much more flexibility with, um, with how I want to use it and where I want to use it. So that's, you can imagine if this game was embedded into a full objective eval of a chronic pain patient, it would be, it would have to go in your chronic pain course or it'd have to go, you know, um, in a particular time frame in ortho. Um, so the same, the same concept related to the screening medical conditions for referral. Um, I think those will be mini games that cover some of the common red flag conditions which we're writing a CPG on right now. And, um, and those games will help students make decisions about referral, simple as that. They, it, they'll be largely signs, symptoms, and some decision-making. So I don't know if that helps. Andrew. Yeah, that helps. Yeah, that helps a lot. And actually, I think that's a great idea. We, as far as I know, we don't currently bring a psychologist in. I think that is a good idea that you guys are using that. I think I'll yeah. ask our... Uh, we have a couple on our campus that we work with, so see if they yeah. would come in and do something along those lines. And then secondly, when's that CPG coming out? That'll be- That's, That CPG is gonna take a while. We, we've <laughs> finished doing the literature review for the bulk of the conditions, and we are now proposing what the write-up will look like, but it will be, I mean, CPGs, I would say at least a year or two. Todd Davenport's at the head of the wheel, so he will lead us to victory, I hope, but it's been a, it's a, He's, um, he knows how to write CPGs, that's for sure. It's just, it's a, it's a unique one, right? Because the CPG is usually on one topic. Right. But for red flags, you've got all of these unusual conditions, you know, these rare conditions. So it's a little bit more challenging. Mike, yeah. can, you, uh, can you announce how to access the recording of this? Yes, um, we all, all of you who are signed up for this will get a follow-up email and that will have the recording in there. It will also be hosted. Let me show you where it will be hosted because a lot of our webinars are hosted in the same location. If you go to physiou.health under educator faculty resources, you will see deep dive webinar series. So once this video is rendered and we create a time card for it, you will be able to see facu faculty webinar simulations deep dive. And so it will be here, you can click on this this is one of our older, older ones. The newest one will be updated here. So other comments, thoughts? Michael, oh, yeah. Michael, one quick one. Sure. Um, and maybe this is already done and I just haven't seen it. Um, relative to CPGs, like the Canadian C cases where they would indicate referral to based on like the Canadian C-spine rules or Ottawa ankle rules, knee rules, are those um, 
within or could they be within you know little cases when would they decide to use imaging and then even if if there were sample images of like oh this would be an mr of this condition you know not making it a radiology course but hey by the way this is the imaging that they might do related to these conditions oh you mean even making potential suggestion about what imaging might be appropriate just as a conversation referral conversation yeah and now you have you know some states coming out of the ability to order radiographs right you know it's like okay based on those rules that makes it easier to say hey i want a radiograph because of the criteria with canadian c-spine or ottawa ankle rules where it's like oh let's get an image yeah that's i mean that would be Actually, Jeff, that might be a conversation. If you would follow up with me on that, sure. you and I can build those together. Okay. Um, because I know you teach the imaging class, um, and we should build actually a bunch of mini games related to imaging to tie it into clinically. I think that would be useful. Um, and actually, I was just talking to the crew recently, and I said, hey, so for the Ottawa ankle rule type game, I actually want to show the person's foot. And I want you to put the landmarks where you're supposed to palpate. And then when they palpate certain areas, then I'll give you the report. I'll give you what you found. Oh, they found significant pal tenderness palpation at the posterior lateral malleolus, right? Or something like that. And um, what decision would you like to make? So those are all perfect little mini games that, again, I, you're right on track. The mini games help us to help the students take the half step. Right. You don't need them to go through an entire full ankle eval, even though in some of our ankle eval games, there is the patient sprain their ankle. You have to do o to y ankle rule. What are the landmarks that you should palpate? So there's stuff like that that are built in. But I think coming from Andrew's perspective, as well as your perspective, some of these um, topic areas that there's varied, uh, there's varied rules in different states about whether you can make orders about radiology. So that's a challenge in and of itself, but we can make right. it generic enough that the learning objective is achieved regardless of whether you're supposed to make the referral or not. So I think maybe you and I could get together on a call, talk through like, what are some of the most common scenarios where imaging, either we could put an image in front of the student, have them make a decision about it, go through the ABCs or, you know, um, and, and then make some decisions and then close it off. And that right. those were the games they would play throughout the semester for imaging. So I think that's right. a great idea. And it wouldn't be hard for us to do as long as you had the energy to storyboard it with me. We could we could build yeah. it. Very sounds good. good. Okay, we'll touch base about that. All right, sounds good. All right. Hey, thank Thanks. you everybody. Please feel free to reach out to me if anybody um, needs to. It's mike at physiou.com. And um, thank you for attending, yeah.